Okay, so um, the title of the sermon today is What Are You Counting On? And I'm going to begin uh, in 1 Chronicles, let me get there, uh, chapter 21. Let's do that. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. I did, we did not make slides for this passage because it's kind of long. Okay? So y'all bear with me. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Chronicles 21, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Okay. <clears throat> Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab and, and the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, May the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? The king's word, however, overruled Joab. So Joab left and went throughout Israel, then came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering, because the king's command was repulsive to him. This command was also evil in the sight of God, so he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. The Lord said to Gad, David's seer, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine. Three months of being swept away before your enemies with their swords overtaking you are three days of the sword of the Lord, days of plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was going to do so, the Lord saw it and was grieved because of the calamity, and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Verona, the Jebusite. All right. Were you all able to bear with me through that? Okay, so David counted his fighting men, and it was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, there was a tirade of things that caused the Lord's anger to burn against Israel. But most commentaries agree that this happened because Israel was becoming prideful and beginning to trust more in their strength than in the God who had called them. Okay? But how often do we as Christians, especially us more seasoned Christians, do something similar? How did David, think about this for a minute, how did David go from counting out five stones in a creek to go face Goliath with a sling when he was a nobody in the eyes of men to counting his fighting men after he had become king. Think about that. We have to be careful that the same thing doesn't happen to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. This is what it says. I don't know if y'all can all see the screen over here. But it says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
Remember who you were when you were first called? Remember the faith you had when you were first called? Many of us, when we were first called, didn't have a dollar to our name. I know, I didn't. But we were ready to take on the world for Jesus. Do you remember those days? I remember having almost zero dollars when I was called to go on a mission trip. I've told y'all this story. That costed like $2,400. I had nothing. I had debt. That's what I had. But God called me to go. And I had only been saved in the church for a few months. Listen, all I had was a word from God to step out on. That's all I had. But it was all I needed. I didn't have a college degree or an iPhone or a million dollars or an insurance policy or anything else. That step out of the boat was on nothing more than a call to go. Many of us, when we were first called, didn't have a job we liked. A car we liked. A house we liked. A degree to fall back on. Many of us were single. But here's what we did have when we were first called. A newfound joy. A new purpose. And a faith to move mountains. And I'm going to tell you, that's where most of the miracles happened. Most of the miracles that happened in my life happened in those beginning stages. The ones that marked me the most. Oh, it's not that they don't still happen, because they do. I see God's hand in my life. I see God move in my life. But most of the miracles that marked me the most happened during that time. Listen, when you don't have anything or anyone to count on but God, you're going to experience Him. See, in some ways, it seems to me, by reading, by reading this and just by knowing about David's life in the Bible, in some ways, to me, David was almost better off as the guy who had nothing to lose. Because it led him to count on God instead of counting his fighting men. Didn't it? Right? How many fighting men he had was what he was now counting on. And listen, here's the funny thing about it. It didn't matter how many fighting men there were when he faced Goliath. Because they were all shaking in their boots. It didn't matter how many thousands of fighting men there were there. They were all scared to face Goliath. Right? Sure. David had no one but God to count on in that hour. <clears throat> but who or what are some of us counting on now? Our finances, health insurance, education, politicians, or the God who saved us in the first place. And all these things aren't bad. You know, some of these things are in God's will for our lives. Listen, God's going to give us victory. Amen. He's going to. In many, many areas of our life. God is going to give us victory. That's part, that's part of the, the, the benefits of following Christ. God's going to give us victory. But here's the thing. We have to be careful that our blessings aren't causing us to feel safe. Listen to what I'm about to say very carefully. From having to live by faith. You see... 
We don't want to feel safe from living by faith. Because the truth of the matter is, faith doesn't feel safe. Yeah. Right. Does it? Who's ever stepped out in faith? Raise your hand. Did that feel safe? It doesn't feel safe to our flesh at all. Living by faith goes against everything our sin nature and our flesh knows. <laughs> Doesn't it? Look at Peter stepping out of the boat on the water. That goes against everything my phys physical body, worldly knowledge, um, that goes against everything it knows to step out of a boat and walk on water, right? But, but listen, walking by faith is like that. And it doesn't feel safe to us. But that's where victory is. That's where victory is. Psalms 119.32. Y'all might be a little confused for a minute by why I pulled this scripture, but you'll see where I'm going. Psalms 119.32. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Doesn't that sound like the heart of a man or a woman coming to Christ? I run in the path of your commands. <clears throat> because truth be told, when we come to Christ, we're usually broke, busted, bruised, scarred, scared, downtrodden. Who's been there? in need of healing. And we run in the path of His commands. Yeah. And that's the right thing to do. And we come to the Lord seeking many things, don't we? Man, I remember all the things I needed. I was so needy when I first came to Christ. My goodness. Remember all the things you prayed for? And that we're supposed to. Bible says you have not because you ask not. So there's nothing wrong with it. I just, I remember how needy I was. Yeah? And we like to think, oh, well, when God does give me this thing I've been praying about for years, or that thing, I'm going to keep pursuing Him with the same intensity. We like to say that to ourselves, or we like to think that when we're, we've been praying about something for a long time. Oh, when I do get it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pursuing God with the same intensity. But listen, as our lives become more comfortable with these victories, we need to be careful that we don't get too comfortable. And stop running in the way of His command. Some of the comforts of this life compete with our dependence on God. When we don't have to depend on God for anything, life gets boring real quick. I don't know if you noticed that. When you stop having to live by faith, life gets boring. Especially when you're used to, to, to walking on the water for a long period of time. And then you come into a, a moment that, that's, that's more comfortable and easier. It almost feels like, like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. When we don't have to depend, depend on God for anything, do we even really feel alive? It feels safe. Kind of. Oh, I, I've, I've reached a place of victory. But then you're just kind of like, man, where's the passion? Where's the intensity? Where's the fire? Where's the fervor? Remember David when he was just a shepherd boy? Listen, this is so interesting. His work and life 
did not compete with his relationship with God. He was actually just a lowly shepherd boy out there tending the sheep. But those were his training grounds. That's where he slew the lion and the bear. That gave him faith to later slay the lion. His, his work and his life did not compete right. with, with his relationship with God. That's cool, huh? Yeah. That's why we should never try to exalt ourselves out of the place that God's placed us. Because God is training us in that place. Now, it's natural for us to seek comfort. But we need to be careful that it doesn't lead us off the path. There is a, a movie called The Pilgrim's Progress. I'm going to reference it a couple times here. Um, some of you have probably seen it. There's old, old versions of it. There's newer versions of it. I recommend watch the newer version if you watch it. You might not get little, kid, little kids in the room because there's a couple parts that are a little scary for young, young, young eyes. But it is a Christian movie. And it was actually written by a man. The book was written by a man who was in prison for the gospel in Bedford, England in the 1600s. I don't remember exactly what year. And he had a dream while he was in prison for the gospel. And it became this beloved book that I think many Christian schools actually require their students to read it. Um, but it's also been made into a movie. Anyway, so during this movie, there's two men on the path to heaven, and they come to, they come to this place where the, the road is really rocky. And one of them starts complaining. He said, man, this, this road, this rocks are hurting my feet. And there's this beautiful meadow here to the side and a fence, a little fence right there. And he said, wait, why don't we take it this way? Because it was more comfortable. There was nice grass. And, and the other guy said, well, maybe we shouldn't get off the path. He said, oh, no, no, it's okay. He said, look, they run in the same direction. He said, it looks like if we just take this meadow, it'll take us right on back around uh, in the same direction. So they hop the fence and they take the meadow. And they wind up in the castle of despair, which is, I guess, a representative of a spiritual stronghold that they didn't, couldn't get out of for quite some time. We have to be very careful that we don't get off the path God has for us seeking comfort. Some things look like a more comfortable way for us. Oh yeah, wait a minute. No, that job over there runs in the same direction as the path. I think if I take this, it can take me right on around over here, right, right back to the path. Don't get off the path God has for you. Seeking comfort. Another thing a life of comfort can do, it can cause us to stop taking risks to advance the kingdom of God. It can cause us to stop being bold. Remember when you had nothing to lose? Man, you were ready. You were ready to take any risk, any challenge. Man, this faith stuff feels too risky. I, want, I just want to feel safe. If we get too used to seeing our provision, we might not want to step out on a word anymore. If we get too used to seeing our provision. And it leads me to ask a question. If what many Christians call victory is really victory. Now don't get me wrong. It was God's will for David to be king. 
for David to have victory. It was God's will. God had given David a promise that he would have victory and rest on all sides. But in some ways, David may have been better off when he was just a lowly shepherd boy with a sling and a stone and a faith that could move mountains. We need to be careful that our victory and comfort doesn't cause us to do evil in the eyes of the Lord and start counting our fighting men. Or should I say start counting on our fighting men, our finances, our degree, our health plan, our bank account, fill in the blank. The things that make us feel safe. We have to be very careful we don't begin to count on these things. Revelation 2, 4 through 5. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Listen to that. Repent and do the things you did at what? First. At first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Wow. See, we have seen the people in here who are more seasoned Christians. Especially, we have to be very, very careful. But sometimes we don't do the things that we did at first. And you know why? Because many of these so-called victories demand so much of our attention. I'm kind of glad I don't have more than I have right now. I'm kind of glad I don't have more than I have right now. Because if I did, it would, it would compete for my attention and devotion to the Lord. If I have more than I have right now, what I have now already competes. Think about that. Think about the upkeep of everything you have. It all competes for your attention. And we have to be very careful because the pursuit of comfort can cause us to forget why we were called in the first place. Revelation 10, 9 and 10. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. I love this verse. I love these verses. I just got to tell y'all before we... I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, it turned my stomach sour. Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Okay. So you see, this was John. Uh, he was on the Isle of Patmos when he had the vision. Um, he broke the book of Revelation. And this is one of the things that happened during that vision. An angel came to him with a little scroll. And he said, take it and eat it. In your mouth it will be sweet as honey, but it will turn your stomach bitter. Listen, this gospel, this gospel, this word, is as sweet as honey to me. It's as sweet as honey to me because it brings me salvation. It brings me hope. But listen, it should not leave me comfortable. Do you see? It turned his, his, his stomach sour. That's not comfortable. It turned his stomach sour. Then he said, you must again prophesy about many nations, languages, and kings. You must go. This life in Christ shouldn't just leave us comfortable while people are out there going to hell. Amen. You see where our battle is? Whatever your goal looks like. 
God's given me specific instructions of what my go looks like. I have, a, I have specific instructions of what my go looks like. And God gives you specific instructions of what your go looks like. And somehow it all comes together into one body. Working together to complete the Great Commission. Right? I have a go. You have a go. And somehow it's the same go. God's called me to do this. God's called you to do that. And somehow together we do it. Together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Working together to complete the Great Commission. And listen, to do that, it's not going to be comfortable. I promise. It is not going to be comfortable. God showed me a road one time. I was on the way to the Olympic Games in Brazil to preach the gospel. And God showed me, I, I, was, it was, I was still a ways out, you know, and I'm praying. And I, and I just, in my spirit, I can see this road. And I can see the highway going to the Olympic Games. But I wasn't taking the highway. There was this little road off of the highway that I was to take to get there. And I, and I often was trying to figure out, what does that mean? What does that mean? It was off the beaten path. <laughs> Listen, you should have seen the places we went to, pre to preach the gospel. Places steeped in drugs, gang violence, addiction, infirmities, witchcraft. It wasn't comfortable. A lot of the time. I remember sitting in a house and, and, and this lady um, and her husband, you know, they, they allowed us to come in. We we're preaching the gospel in this little bitty town out in the middle of nowhere. I'm sitting in this house and I'm preaching to this, to this woman and there was a, a, some other people there with me and a man just comes up to the window right by the street and just sticks his arms up on the, on the, on the window like that and he's looking in at me and I'm sitting there and he's telling me, don't, don't preach to them. She's a witch. Don't preach to her. And things like that happen a lot. That was normal. I remember sitting in places where, actually, I'll tell you a story in a minute. I don't want to get too, ahead, too far ahead of myself. But listen, it wasn't comfortable a lot of the time. And the first mission trip I went on to South America, I remember, the pastor of the little church we were helping, he, he, he was a Brazilian, but he, he grew up, him and his wife, in this quaint little town out in the middle of the countryside of Brazil, this nice little place, you know, uh, that you'd see on a movie or something, right? And he moved from this nice little place to the big city. From this quaint little town in the countryside to the big city. And he, they planted this church. We were working with them. And I remember as we went from house to house, I remember thinking, we'd be sitting in a house and, that, and uh, we'd be preaching the gospel and everything. I remember thinking, man, this place looks a little dangerous. And, and there were some other Americans with me, you know, we kind of talked to each other and everything, and they kind of agreed, like, yeah. Uh, this, this place feels dangerous. And um, as the, the years went by uh, and everything, and, and, and I, I had caught, been called to Brazil, I started learning Portuguese and everything, and, and I got to where I could actually talk to the pastor in his own language. And, I, and, and he, got, he gave me the scoop. He said, Sean, when we moved here, planted this little church, he said there were 10 young boys who lived on the street. When we planted this church, it was just, just from here to, to across Highway 90 is about how long that street was. And there was all these little houses on both sides. He said, when we planted this church, he said there were 10 little boys who lived on this street right here. 
He said between the drugs and the gangs and the gun violence, I'm alive today. Talk about leaving comfort. But we have to be careful that we don't get too comfortable in this Christian life and it causes us to avoid uncomfortable places and situations where the lost people are. See, sometimes just because we live such a comfortable life in our victory, we don't want to even stop to help people or to tell people about Jesus because it's too uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me. Another thing being too comfortable causes is spiritual drowsiness. We've got to stay awake. We've got to stay awake. Matthew 25, 1 through 6. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Amen. So this is speaking of, what I believe is speaking of the rapture of the church, when Jesus comes back for his church, right? And it said the bridegroom was a long time in coming, so they became what? Drowsy. Some of y'all might be drowsy right now. <laughs> they became drowsy and fell asleep. Listen, this indicates that in the last days, we're going to battle with spiritual drowsiness. And I believe we're in the last days. Spiritual drowsiness. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We're all going to face this. And here it says all ten of the virgins went to sleep. Now, I don't know what all that means. <laughs> but I know that we've got to fight spiritual drowsiness, especially in these last days. Isn't that what it said? The bridegroom was a long time in coming? Yeah. That tells me that the closer to, it gets to the return of Jesus, the harder it may be to stay awake. That's right. yeah. Amen. We need to be aware of this. So there's the end times element. But maybe even more so for us seasoned believers who have reached a place of comfort. Revelation 16, 15. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Hmm. You know, in that same movie, The Pilgr Pilgrim's Progress, a little bit later on in the movie, these two Christians came to a place called the Enchanted Ground. And in this place, the, the plants gave off these spores and the air naturally made one drowsy. And along the way, they had to encourage each other to stay awake. And the way they did it in the movie, which I thought was interesting, was they talked about the Lord. That's the way that they encouraged each other and stayed awake. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Now these are the words of Jesus. He said, where two or more are gathered in his name, there he will be with us. I tell you, I can't think of a better way to stay awake than to have the presence of Jesus in our midst. Can you? I can't think of a better way. You remember the, the two men who were on the road to Emmaus in the Bible? And they were, they were talking. They were, they were downtrodden because Jesus had just been crucified. And, and 
Now his body was, was missing from the tomb, you remember? And they were downtrodden and they were, they were talking about these things. And all of a sudden, Jesus came and started walking alongside him. Wow, isn't that so cool? Yeah. And, he, and all of a sudden, Jesus began to explain to them, um, you know, what the, what the, the prophets had, had said about this, these, this happening and everything. And then they didn't recognize that it was Jesus, right? And they go into the house and Jesus begins to break the bread and they recognize him all of a sudden and he disappears, you remember? Isn't that a cool story? Well, guess what? When you and I just, let's say we're, we're just out doing something and we just start talking about Jesus, guess what? He comes and he starts walking with us. Amen? Amen. Man, I can't think of a better way to stay away than to have the presence of Jesus in our midst. But we can get so dang comfortable in our victory that we may even start to become spiritually drowsy. You know how it is when you sit in a real comfortable recliner after you eat lunch or something? Yeah, anyone ever been there? It'd be more of a miracle if you don't go to sleep. <laughs> and that's what can happen if we get too comfortable in this Christian life. Y'all getting too comfortable and starting to trust in the wrong things, it caused Israel to have to go through some, some bad stuff. <laughs> we got to be careful we don't put our trust in the wrong things. We've got to be careful we don't get too comfortable and forget who gives us the victory. Amen. And I don't know if the problem is really counting these things, but counting on these things. Right? Many, of us, many people say, oh, count your blessings. And I can understand that from an adoration or, or, or thankfulness point of view. But don't count on your blessings. There are many benefits to following Jesus in this life. But listen, this is not a call to comfort. <laughs> this is not a call to comfort. This is a call to take up a cross. And I told our youth group in Brazil one time, I want to wrap up. I said, don't wait and this was back when smartphones were becoming a thing. That's how old I am. I was old enough to preach when smartphones were becoming a thing. Um, but I remember telling them, I said, don't wait till you have an iPhone to start living for Jesus. Don't wait till you have a degree to start living for Jesus. Don't wait till you're married to start living for Jesus. Because chances are, if you make excuses now, when you do have those things, you'll never really live for Jesus. Yeah. Everything we need to do God's will is in His will. Mm -hmm. And I told them, let down your nets for a catch. Remember Jesus when He got in the boat with His disciples? They'd been fishing all night. Caught anything. And Jesus said, put out from the boat of the ways and let down your nets for a catch. Let down your nets for a catch. We need to stop just counting our blessings and let down our nets for a catch. Amen. Because you know in eternity, it's not going to matter what degree you have what your bank account looked like, what make or model your car was. Revelation 22, 12. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Amen? We need to be living for this day. Amen. This should be our focus. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. 
I will give to each person according to what they have done. Amen. Amen. Let's stay awake. Let's not count on our blessings and our comfort. In fact, we should probably be, probably be looking to get uncomfortable. To make sure that this gospel makes it around the world. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Someone can hit the lights. All I have to do is ask Bianca. She'll do it. Okay. <laughs>